All right. Well, it looks like it is 2.30 my time, which is central time, which means it is time to go ahead and get started. And I've been told to keep this very on time. Um, and so welcome everyone to uh, this book session today. My name is Annie Vest, and I am the vice president of the National Hazard Mitigation Association. And I also serve as the mitigation and disaster planning lead at Freeze and Nichols. Um, I'm really excited to have been asked by Lori Peake to moderate this session to discuss underwater, the loss, flood insurance, and the moral economy of climate change in, in the United States by Dr. Rebecca Elliott. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Elliott, congratulations on such an extraordinary book, uh, Underwater. I was uh, riveted by a book about insurance. I didn't know how I would feel reading a book about flood insurance, but I very quickly found that it was something that um, with really every turn of the page that um, made me feel so personally attached based on my own experiences as a practitioner in this space of hazard mitigation, climate change, and flood risk reduction. And we just make so many assumptions about how the public perceives flood risk and the actions they do or do not understand or take about existing flood risk. And so this book just becomes so incredibly important to the practitioner community. Um, and academics, I'm certain, can find additional research themes to pull out of it as well. And there's just so much at stake. And so I'm eager to have this conversation and to really hear this very diverse perspective um, of our scene panelists come together and discuss this topic, um, especially in light of the recent implementation of uh, Risk Rating 2.0. So um, I'm going to just very casually discuss how this session is going to work. And um, Lori sent me very regimented instructions on how it's going to work and how our panelists will uh, interact. And so um, first and foremost, um, I'm going to uh, have we have four panelists. So we have Miyuki Hino with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, Paul Huang, who's our uh, assistant administrator of the federal insurance for the National Flood Insurance Program at FEMA, uh, Larry Larson with the Association of State Floodplain Managers, and Anna Weber with the Natural Resource Defense Council. And um, after I introduce uh, the author, Dr. Rebecca Elliott, uh, each of our panelists will have 10 minutes to give their comments on the book. Uh, but before I introduce them, I want to um, make sure that our audience knows that this is really intended to be a um, interactive discussion. So it's going to be feel very much, there's a lot of comments with our author, there's a lot of comments between our author and our panelists, but ultimately we want you to interact. Please use the chat function through the duration to input questions as they come to you. And um, after our panelists give 10 minutes, we'll let Dr. Elliott uh, respond and then we will go to our audience for the questions. So please do keep them coming in. Don't be shy. Feel free to turn on your cameras and interact with us. This is intended to be a really fun, fun type of a session for you guys. Um, and so without further ado, I would like to uh, go ahead and introduce our author to give some remarks about the book. And that is Dr. Rebecca Elliott. So Dr. Elliott, if you wanna go ahead and turn on your mic and camera and I will turn it to you. Great, thanks so much, Annie, for moderating. Um, thank you all so much for joining today. Um, Thanks to Lori Peak for the invitation to, to do this and for putting this panel together. And then a huge, huge thanks to my co-panelists. I am honored, quite intimidated, um, and uh, very excited to discuss the book with you. Uh, so Underwater, as Annie mentioned, and as you know, if, if you've had a chance to read it, you would know, is a book about flood insurance, about the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, many in this audience will be familiar. But in case you aren't, uh, the NFIP is the public federal program that underwrites flood insurance in the US. Um, and so this is also an extremely special event for me and for this book, because as many of you may also know, the one of the kind of principal architects, maybe the principal architect of the NFIP was Gilbert White, uh, the founder and director of the NHC. Um, so as I hope the book makes clear, I have immense respect for not only the imagination and the ambition of Dr. White in establishing the NFIP, but also for his kind of clear-eyed assessments of the program's successes and limitations as it became a real thing in the world. Um, 
So with, with the time I have now, just a, in a few minutes, I want to tell you a bit about what's in the book, um, why I wrote it, uh, and what I think different kinds of readers might get out of it. Um, so for me, I think flood insurance helps us to begin to tell an even bigger story about loss and climate change. And for a while now, this has really been the, the kind of problem that has preoccupied me in my own research. You know, how do we understand, how do we address destabilizing losses that can ruin individuals and communities, losses that some will resist and mourn, losses that are financial, but also social and emotional. And my, my view is that this problem is kind of at the core of understanding how people will fare in a climate changed US and indeed in a climate changed world. So if this is the problem, you know, then how and why did I arrive at the NFIP as a, as a way into it? Um, the genesis of underwater was what I saw unfolding in New York City after Hurricane Sandy in late 2012. And so you just had the kind of coincidence of a lot of different events um, that weren't kind of initially related to each other, but all just sort of formed, you know, a perfect storm, uh, pun not intended. Um, but what happened there was that, you know, after the floodwaters had receded, after New Yorkers had started to rebuild and repair their homes in order to get back to normal, which as you all know, people so often do, um, many of them learned at that point that they may no longer be able to afford to insure their homes um, in the near term or over the longer term. Uh, the flood risk maps for the city had been updated. That was actually something that was in the works before Sandy. Um, and the rules determining the price of flood insurance had changed um, because of a recent congressional reform. So when all of this kind of distilled down to, to the ground, um, what this meant for people was that their annual premiums looked like they were going to be increasing. Um, and this was very scary to people. Um, one man in Rockaway, Queens told me that these new maps um, that he only sort of understood uh, and the higher premiums that they were seeming to make possible were quote, scarier than another storm. And so, um, some families had to kind of confront this possibility of being priced out of their homes and neighborhoods and really even more importantly for a lot of people losing tremendous value on their most important asset, their house in the process. Um, but at the same time, and this is really important for the story I tell in the book, uh, the, the losses that they were facing were not only things that could be calculated in dollars and cents. They were the loss of a sense of security, a rhythm of life, connections to a community or a history, and the stable meanings that root a sense of identity and belonging. But of course, all the while, you know, many people had gotten back to normal, um, which leaves them vulnerable and exposed to the next catastrophic flood, uh, which recent experience and climate science give us reason to expect will become a more regular fact of life in many parts of the country. And the NFIP was already tens of billions of dollars in debt to the US Treasury with no reserve to pay claims when that next flood came. So I followed the story from there, um, and it just kind of so happened that what unfolded in the years that followed was this period of really intense nationwide contestation over what flood insurance fundamentally is, what it should do, and how it will shape the experience of loss as the climate changes. And as Annie alluded to, you know, we may be on the brink of another such period um, due to developments since the book was published, which you know I'd be keen to hear more about from the panelists and from those of you uh, with knowledge of it in the Q&A. Um, but the book takes the long view on these controversies. So I actually start at the beginning of the NFIP and even before um, using archival data to kind of piece together the thinking that went into designing this, this program, which was a really, I mean, it's hard to, to overstate how bold of an experiment this was at the time that it was founded. Um, but in that history, we see some of the key tensions that continue to plague flood insurance and not just flood insurance, but insurance for natural hazards more generally. Um, we see those tensions kind of at the very start of the program between what a risk-based rate should do and who it should apply to and what a reasonable or affordable rate should be and how long those should apply. Um, and, you know, the program was meant to kind of broadly underwrite the unequally accessible, of course, American dream of homeownership. Um, and so it's, it's very much a part of a, a larger story about the kind of uh, expansion of, of homeownership in the middle of the 20th century. Um, the book then follows flood insurance from the halls of Congress in the 1960s onto the streets of New York City many decades later. Um, 
And it was through interviews and ethnographic observation, the kinds of go-to tools of, of a sociologist, um, that I tried to understand what it was that could make a flood map scarier than another storm. And, you know, I found that when people encountered flood insurance, they were trying to situate themselves in relation to a plurality of risks and multiple kinds of value, which combined in ways that shaped their decisions about what they were going to do next. So would making the house safer by elevating it mean draining a child's college fund or retirement savings? Um, the NFIP rules and the maps had changed, but could they change again? And if so, does it make sense to take action now? Um, the new maps of flood risk didn't formally take into account climate change, but they were, were they saying something about it anyway? You know, people were kind of unclear about that. So it was never as simple as a, as a kind of sheer financial calculation based on a risk assessment. Um, so then, I, you know, I, the kinds of dilemmas that I was witnessing on the ground in New York City became a national story um, because they were connected to this congressional reform of the NFIP that had passed in the months before Sandy. Um, and so a chapter of Underwater focuses on that reform and on the different kind of political coalitions, some of which might surprise us, um, that formed around, around reform in the NFIP at this stage. The book also unpacks uh, the production of flood maps and insurance premiums, which so often um, throughout the NFIP's history have been those kind of focal objects of controversy. And I examine those instruments not as many people do to make a claim that FEMA gets it wrong or FEMA gets it right. Um, because those are claims that I think depend on a, an idea of politics as happening somehow separately from science. Um, Instead, I, I try to show how, you know, the choice to include or exclude some factors and not others reflects public policy objectives, often implicit social models and moral commitments that are embedded in professions, governance institutions and the culture at large. So reasonable people can disagree about how to best assess and price risk um, and fights about those kinds of technical questions can't actually avoid or definitively resolve the fundamental question of how we ought to live with uncertainty, hazards, catastrophes, and losses. Um, so it may be clear at this point that as I researched this book, uh, you know, the various people that I encountered in the story could not talk about what is wrong with the NFIP or what needs to be made right without talking about what is fair, prudent, just, deserved, or equitable. So there's often a very kind of moral and moralized language around something that on its face is very technical, very arcane. And this is, I think, what gives the book its broader stakes. So to me, the NFIP provides an opportunity to think through what I call the moral economy of climate change. So a, a, a site where we can kind of witness how our moral ideas are entangled with our economic arrangements. Um, but in even a broader sense, I think the NFIP shapes the kind of problem that climate change is considered to be. You know, it, it makes climate change an economic problem by, by economizing it, by kind of giving us dollars and cents to talk about it. Um, but I think it also shapes who we think is responsible for addressing it and how. And from the NFIP, you know, I think that, and I argue in the book, that we see that some of the thorniest challenges ahead of us are these unsettled and unsettling questions of responsibility for loss, justification of loss, and compensation for loss. Um, so if you're the kind of reader who knows a lot about flood insurance, um, but you're used to thinking only about how it manages our relationship to the water, I hope you'll appreciate this account of how it also manages our relationships to each other. Um, if you're the kind of reader who knows nothing about flood insurance, I hope this book conveys how massively important insurance is for channeling the effects of natural hazards and of those we associate with climate change into the lives of families, communities, and governments. And if you're the kind of reader that wants a new angle on understanding the climate crisis, I hope this book gives you a view into how it intersects with the programs and institutions that we've long been using to manage loss in a, a kind of American political economy that puts property ownership at, at the center of social provision. Um, but no matter what kind of reader you are, I hope the book clarifies some of what is at stake here uh, and the kinds of collective conversations that we might want to take part in uh, if we are to confront loss, our own and that of others, equitably and humanely. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you again, all of you for being here and I'm excited for the conversation. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on then to our panel 
comments on the book. I do want to remind each of you to please pay attention to your clock. You have 10 minutes and I will start to kind of hint through social cues that uh, you're nearing your end. So uh, we will skip over to first uh, Miyuki, if you want to introduce yourself and go into your book comments. Sure. Thanks, Annie. And um, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm Miyuki Hino. I'm an assistant professor in city and regional planning at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, I think about flood insurance all the time. <laughs> um, and I will tell you, I uh, absolutely loved reading this book. I, I read it in two sittings. I loved um, the nitty gritty details on what happens when you want to challenge a flood insurance map and how those decisions are made and who's doing what. Um, and I loved the really big picture let's think about what this means for, for real estate in a changing climate. I thought it did a really fantastic job of, of going back and forth between these, these small technocratic things that someone we never think about and these things that really get covered all the time kind of when we talk about the climate crisis more broadly. So um, I loved reading this book. Um, I will kick off our, our panel comments today with two things I really liked about the book and two places where I wanted a little bit more uh, depth, I think, or a little bit more nuance. Um, the first thing that jumped out at me right away uh, that I really appreciate about this book was the historical context of where the NFIP came from. I think so often today, the narrative is that the program is broken, it's a failure of a system, and that's because it's in debt. But what the first chapters of this book do so beautifully is they really bring to light the, the varied and rich motivations for the NFIP to be developed to begin with, much of which were not about uh, you know actuarially correct risk pricing, but were about solidarity. It was about giving people the opportunity to protect themselves. Uh, not relying on politicians to, you know, authorize varying amounts of aid in response to any given event. Um, and the NFIP still today is doing all of those things. Um, and so I think it really uh, questioned um, in like the archival quotes do this wonderful job of kind of questioning the assumption that a private sector model was actually the goal to begin with. Um, and that actual soundness was you know, it was maybe uh, one of many things that the NFIP was originally conceived of doing, perhaps by some and not by others. Um, and I think that's incredibly important to keep in mind today as we look at reforms moving forward. Um, I can't tell you the number of conversations I've had where, where someone will, will, will be talking about the NFIP and I'll say, well, there's a reason we have a public flood insurance program to begin with. And they'll stop and go, well, why is that actually? You know, and so like this whole idea that we have a, a public insurance program, partly because the private companies were not doing what we thought was necessary, I think it is so important to inject back into the dialogue that we're having now uh, about flood insurance. Um, the second thing I, I loved, which I also thought was unusual about this book was uh, treating true risk as both a, a scientific construct and a social construct. Um, and I love that there were actually quotation marks around true risk at lots of places in the book because uh, you can see throughout the book that people kind of, you know, use the term to achieve their own goals. Um, and this, it was a really nice reminder throughout this book that true risk is, um, it's a concept, that flood risk is fundamentally uncertain, um, that people can say that uh, you know, we want the maps to be 100% correct, but nobody knows what that is. Um, and uh, again, I think uh, we tend to fall into this simplified dialogue that like, well, it's wrong. Um, but the truth is that true risk is something that we're going to contest, right? And that's going to mean different things to different people. And I, I really appreciated that. Um, Two things, two places where I would say what really is what I, I wanted more of it, because I continued turning the pages thinking the book might continue after it had ended, um, but it, it is really a quick read. Um, what is, you know, I think people, uh, at least some people, have this idea that people are choosing to take on flood risk. And if people are making that choice, then therefore they should, should bear the, the, the cost of that choice. And um, it's clear from this book that not everyone has that choice, right? It is not a choice for everyone. 
Um, and one, the place that I, I was hoping we could dig into more is what would it look like to give people that choice? You know, what does, what are the policy responses that uh, make, reduce the, the size of the population where we feel like they do not have a choice, that they are burdened with flood risk and they, and they don't have any other opportunities. Um, and I think that can take lots of different forms, but um, I do think this idea of, of what's a choice and what's not a choice um, is really interesting and uh, kind of worth digging into that tension more. Um, connected to that, you know, right at the end of the book, there was a allusion to health insurance and some of the debates about health insurance coverage. And um, I also wonder if, if health insurance is that at least for a way of like relating these flood insurance challenges to a broader population, potentially a place where you could uh, get more traction out of, uh, you know, relating the, the notion of pre-existing conditions, right, to, to the flood risk context. Um, I think we accept broadly that, that healthy people might pay more to subsidize people who are less healthy. And we expect that there are things that, that there are health conditions that aren't choices. Um, but then we also, for example, on, on the state insurance, health insurance plan in, in North Carolina, you pay significantly more if you are a smoker, right? So that is a, a case where we've decided we're gonna frame that as a choice. And therefore people who make that choice are gonna bear the burden. So that was kind of all of this, this thing around choice. And, and I was wondering where there's health insurance um, could be brought in a little bit more. The last thing, um, that I'll mention before I, I pass on the time to the other panelists is um, insurance and pricing in future changes in risk. Um, I think at least in, in some venues, I think insurance is seen as sort of this magic bullet of like, if we can just get all the price signals right, then everyone's going to do the right thing and risk is going to disappear. But insurance is a risk transfer mechanism, right? Not a risk reduction mechanism. And if I'm going to buy insurance for one year, I want to pay the price that reflects my risk of flooding in that year, right? I don't want to be paying for the price, the chances that I might flood in 30 years if my insurance policy is for one year. Um, and so I don't, I still am uh, unclear. Like I, I still am trying to figure out where is it that insurance can kind of create these levers to actually induce changes that are really forward-looking when it's a short-term risk transfer mechanism? Um, and on top of that, future changes in risk are uncertain. And they're not just uncertain because of climate uncertainty, but because humans create and manage risk. Um, and so if I really firmly believe that they're going to build a, uh, a big seawall in front of my house in the next 10 years, then my vision of future risk and my expectations are totally different than somebody else's. Um, and, and again, right, if insurance is pricing based on the understanding that seawall is not going to happen, right, all of that um, kind of, I think, makes it hard for me to see exactly how how insurance is a can be this force for long-term thinking in the climate resilience space. Um, though of course it can shift decisions today that have long-term implications, right? But I think it's I don't see how I'm going to get a price signal for 30 years from now in my insurance uh, in my insurance policy today. Um, I think that question about the knowability of future risk, gets sort of especially dangerous because um, it introduces the possibility that people can um, put in their expectations about where risk is gonna be managed. And I think that in particular is a little bit scary to think that you might have companies saying, well, they're surely gonna build infrastructure here, but not over here, right? And, and that in particular, I think introduces a lot of um, uh, potential harm that would actually potentially be hard for the general public to see. Um, and so a little bit um, more dangerous in that sense. So those are the two places where I thought, you know, really I just wanted more conversation of it as I try to work through these, these issues in my head. Um, 
but I loved, like I said, I really enjoyed reading the book and um, I got a huge amount out of it and I'm excited to um, pass the book on to all of my students and make them read it too. Thank you so much, Miyuki. Our next panelist will be Paul. Yeah, thanks, Annie. Thanks, Rebecca and Miyuki. Uh, thanks for listening in today. I really appreciate the Natural Hazard Center and Lori Peek reaching out so I could actually, he actually turned on to this book because I hadn't heard about it. Um, and then as I was starting to read it, I was so excited to, to just read my personal history, actually, in the National Flood Insurance Program. So I'm Paul Wong. I'm the Assistant Administrator for the Federal Insurance Directorate. Um, I, I essentially run the insurance operations in the National Flood Insurance Program. I'm actually currently the Acting Deputy Associate Administrator for the Federal Insurance and Mitigation Administration, which oversees all the components of the National Flood Insurance Program. So um, as I was reading this amazing book, um, it was a great encapsulation of the, the history and kind of the big milestones through the 50 plus years that the program was established. Um, and it was super in insightful. And, and Rebecca, you're going to see a bump up in your sales because I'm encouraging all my staff to read it as well. Um, as a practitioner in the program, at first, it can be a little bit critical, right? Like, hey, we run this amazing program. We help so many people yet there are a lot of holes being poked into it. So I thought I'd give a little bit of context as a, my perspective as a practitioner in the program. Um, and it was, again, like a time machine for me. Like I jumped into DeLorean. I started at FEMA 17 years ago in the National Flood Insurance Program in the mapping side. Um, my first large event was Hurricane Katrina. Of course, we took on a huge amount of debt from that program because we weren't designed to be actuarially sound. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of fallen in love with FEMA in those 17 years, every chance I've had to leave, I, I can't leave it because the mission of FEMA speaks to me so greatly. It's to help people before, during, and after disasters. And insurance, in all the times I've been in the field, has shown me that it's a big part of the FEMA mission in helping people before, during, and after disasters. So again, it was a great kind of timeline, time like a history trip for me to go back and reflect on the different events except for Hurricane Betsy. I wasn't quite born when Hurricane Betsy hit. Um, but all the other ones, Sandy, Hurricane Harvey, Irma Maria, uh, those years, um, and most recently, uh, some of the, the local, flood, I mean, the, the large flood events the last couple of years. But when Gilbert White and the founders, like you said, Rebecca, did this bold thing and designed this three-legged stool of flood mapping, flood insurance, and floodplain management, it was... I mean, it was a big, bold change, and it shaped the, the country in a way that we never could have imagined. Um, but when they did that, they did it also because I believe the public sector, you know, government is to fill in the gap that the private sector can't provide. And at the time, because flood insurance is so concentrated, like flooding is so concentrated, and insurers don't like concentrated risk, because we had no identification of flood maps in the country, right? So you didn't even know where the risk was. And we had no standards for buildings um, in floodplains, then the, the private sector didn't want to play in this market. So I think it was smart to design a program to fill a gap that the private sector didn't fill. And once you get into a government program, uh, for all the good intentions, it's hard to unwind it because people and politics and social dynamics, like you say in your book, impact that. So, um, you know. I think every time it rains for a couple of days in your community, we have over 22,000 communities in our, in our program, and it rains a couple of days and your house is dry. No one's going to thank the National Flood Insurance Program, but me as a pr practitioner, maybe to stay positive and, and with a smile on my head, I feel like we're doing something right. I'm proud of that because floodplain management standards, even at the minimum level, the 100 year, 1% annual chance flood elevation. We establish base flood elevations, which communities adapt, ad adopt into their building codes and ordinances. So they were, those homes are safer. Now, did that cause uh, the building of those homes in that flood area? Perhaps. But for those that are in it, there are standards. We know where the flood maps um, and the flood risk are in this country in today's, in today's risk. And we provide insurance to it. So last year, um, 43,000 families were happy they had flood insurance and they, they were happy they had the National Flood Insurance Program because we paid out claims, uh, averaged about $25,000 per claim, right? So I think about like Hurricane Harvey, if you've been in the field like I have after a disaster, only two out of 
10 homes had flood insurance in Harvey that were flooded. And the average federal aid that you provide, I think there was a question in the chat, federal aid that we provided was temporary repairs, individual assistance, temporary power, dry out your home, those type of things, uh, except, uh, some rent for your hotel to stay in if you're displaced. The average was about $8,000 in individual assistance. The average flood insurance payout was over $115,000, right? So I always think like those families, when they hug me and go, thank goodness I had flood insurance, they're appreciative that there was something there that the private sector couldn't provide. That being said, the book points out a lot of the, the pull, pushes and pulls though. What motivates me is it's like this large Rubik's cube, I think, the National Flood Insurance Program. Like you turn one knob and you think that you've gotten closer to the solution only to disrupt another knob, right? So you make it more affordable. Well, you're not providing the real risk premium where you may be driving development. You fix the actuarial thing and you, we provide risk free premiums and someone says it's not equitable. We're hurting those that are disadvantaged. And it's all true. But I think I'm motivated because I think there is an answer eventually. We just haven't been creative enough to find it. Um, so I'm an optimist at heart. Um, a couple of things I want to note, you know, um, March, uh, we'll check on the time, March 1st, 2016, the program was on 60 minutes. No federal program ever wants to be on 60 minutes, right? Post Sandy, claims handling, mismanaged program, you know, alleged fraud, those type of things, not customer centric. Uh, additionally, like your book said, Bigger Waters was passed at the same time. So premiums are increasing. The program's brand is, is not strong. Right. And a year later, I took over the flood insurance program operations. And we're really proud of the team. It's not my doing, but the team's doing in terms of turning that around. We focused on the customer first. We quadrupled our training for agents and adjusters. We focused on not just speed and quality for claim servicing, but also customer service. We mapped the customer journey and said, where can we improve this journey? Beyond that, we like improved our write your own oversight, our partner's oversight. And we also started striving to be a world-class operations. The first day I started in this job, I said, how many claims and how many policies did we sell today? And the answer was, I can tell you, but two months ago, I, I can tell you as of two months ago, because we were on a mainframe computer, right? Running COBOL. Today, we have a modernized cloud-based analytics solution. I can push a button and tell you how many, how, how many policies and claims we did today. But that was all setting us up to transform the NFIP, fix the brand, be customer-centric, modernize the systems so that we could deliver something called risk rating 2.0. In Rebecca's book, the timing wasn't quite right because we did delay it a couple of times, but we launched it this past October and renewal started in April. We've done over a million pol uh, policies under risk rating 2.0. And what this is, is embracing the latest actuarial sciences, technology, and models to get structure-based risk. And it's getting to what Rebecca is talking about in her book, which is we, are, we, we have a duty to tell people, here is your risk. And the insurance price is a signal for that. And in the past, it wasn't granular enough. It wasn't about your property. It was about a zone. So we've changed that. And I think that's a really exciting start to, to have the discussions on, okay, if this is your risk and you have time because of statutory caps to get to that risk, what are you going to do about it? What are we as society going to do about it? and to acknowledge that affordability could be a concern and is a concern, absolute concern based on the study that we did a couple of years ago for many of our policyholders and non-policyholders. So tell them the risk, but make sure we also have an affordability program for those that are low and moderate income and mitigate, reduce that risk, right? And we have, we have to act soon because of climate change and the impacts that we're seeing already. And how do we do this in an equitable way? So those are the challenges ahead of us but we have taken some good strides toward that, both in the flood mapping world, um, in modernizing our flood maps and making them more accurate based on really solid LIDAR uh, um, elevation data. Our floodplain management standards, we're kind of relooking at now as part of the transformation to see what are those standards. Our flood mapping is also looking at non-regulatory products for future change, like Mayuki is asking, is like, what is the future hold, not just today? And how do we plan to that? But there's more to do. So the last thing I would say is I got to meet with the Canadian delegation a couple of weeks ago, and they came to meet with us because they said, we have a charge from our prime minister. We are setting up a national flood insurance program. And I said, what, is, what are the goals of the program? And I thought of your book, this book, Underwater, because they said, 
Well, we've been told that the private sector is recoiling from the markets because of climate change. So they're not insuring some parts. And this is gonna happen in the US too, I believe. So the federal government has to, then we have to create a national program. And we've been given the charge to sell flood insurance to high risk properties at affordable prices. And I thought to myself, oh no, <laughs> high risk properties at affordable pri prices. Like what is the solution? What is our goal, right? Is it home ownership? Absolutely, in my mind, equity, right? Because a lot of the people that live there in those high-risk areas were put there because of systemic issues in our country. So how do we address that? How do we then develop in a safer and stronger way that doesn't leave others behind? And how do we make sure that insurance, there's a private and public sector um, contribution on both sides, right? And those are the challenges ahead of us. So I'm looking forward to this discussion because I, I shared my opinions with the Canadian government and I'm curious as to how they will end up establishing it. But I'm, I'm curious to hear yours as well. Thank you so much, Paul. And what a, no pressure with the Canadians, you know, but you know, what a story they can tell however many years from now. So you're about to make history yourself, it sounds like. Um, and speaking of um, history, our next panelist is Larry Larson with the Association of State Floodplain Managers. So Larry, if you want to unmute yourself. I assume you can hear me. Uh, so I gather, what Annie is saying is I'm old. That's correct, by the way. Uh, I was managing a flood risk management program in 1965 before the NFIP was created. In the state of Wisconsin, we were mapping, requiring communities to regulate. We had standards much stronger than the NFIP standards, I might add, for both mapping and flood risk management. Uh, I worked with Gilbert and uh, with Jim Goddard Jim was in TVA and he said to Gilbert, I'll work with communities to produce a map for them and show them how to regulate those areas to show you a process that can be used for the NFIP. Because as you recall, uh, Jim or Gilbert was trying to promote this idea of let's have a national program where communities regulate risk. <clears throat> now the NFIP is actually the default US flood risk management program. It wasn't designed as, as Paul said originally to include insurance, but it does now. And unfortunately, it's reached the point where insurance is driving the issues instead of flood risk management. We'll talk a bit about that. <clears throat> uh, there's actually four legs to the stool. Not only is it uh, insurance and, and regulation and mapping, but it's also mitigation. And mitigation now we understand is the key. Mitigation did, didn't exist in any form up until the 1988 Disaster Relief Act. Uh, FEMA, in fact, insisted they couldn't help people mitigate because they would, the federal government would then be improving property. So that was a real problem. <clears throat> but we've reached the point now where what's the bottom line of the NFIP? Positive note that there are now 22,000 plus communities that actually have uh, planning and zoning in place to regulate uh, flood risk areas. That did not exist in 1968 when the NFIP was passed. Uh, one of the big concerns of the NFIP is that we have not prevented development in high risk areas. In fact, there is more development happening in high risk areas right now than there is in low risk areas. That's a problem. A part of that is standards, part of it's our mapping, and, and both the, both the ma mapping and management standards are way too low. <clears throat> Developers, of course, have a real, real ability to influence local decision makers as to where development occurs. They have the ability to lobby and convince local decision makers, development is good, that's what makes your community grow and so on. Local citizens don't have that same ability. So what happens is the developer, most homes are not built by individuals. They're built by developers. The individuals simply buy a house that already exists in the development. So if we don't control the developers, we don't control where at risk development happens. Uh, risky land is cheaper, you know, wetlands are cheap to buy. 
Uh, so the developers like that. And by the time the flood happens, the developers long out of town, you know? So we, we've got this dilemma that continues. Now flood insurance has been subsidized for 50 years. That wasn't an NFIP decision. That was a congressional decision. Congress wanted that to happen. Now Congress looks at it differently. Now Congress wants the program to be debt-free, self-sustaining, a whole different. So the, the folks in FEMA are, are stuck with this FEMA or with Congress changing its mind on how they want the program run. Uh, so they're doing their best to try to accommodate that. And, and I think they're, uh, <clears throat> is debt really bad? Look at, the, look at the disaster relief plan. Look at all the money we pay out in disaster relief. That's just simply written off, isn't it? That's not a debt that anybody we keep on the books. Why, how is the NFIP any different than that? Uh, there isn't any reason we should be worried about an NFIP debt. Uh, Congress also wants uh, that, uh, and let me talk about risk rating 2.0 a little bit. The, it's been a lot of discussion about it. As Paul mentioned, uh, Congress is all hung up on it. Everybody else is. There's some positive parts to risk rating 2.0. The first part is you get full risk rates for individuals. That's the positive part that Paul mentioned. Very important. Uh, the, the, what has to go along with that is, is Congress needs to have some affordability for those who, if we're gonna charge full risk rates, there's gonna be people in lots of big areas, mostly older, lower income, socially disadvantaged communities that need help. So there needs to be an affordability program. Uh, FEMA has put forth some recommendations on how that could happen. Will Congress do that in this modification? They haven't done it in the last five years. They've extended the program 22 times, still haven't done anything about it. We don't know if Congress will do anything about it or not. Uh, one of the big problems with risk rating 2.0 is we've lost the connection between mitigation and, and, and rates. Under the old rate system, in Sandy, for example, many people were told, elevate your house four feet. They looked at the rate structure and said, wait a minute, if I elevate eight feet, I get a lot better. I can save that money on, uh, on, on my annual premiums. So they elevated eight feet. Much harder to do that under risk rating 2.0. So that connection, and, and, and uh, Becca talks about that in the book, there needs to be that connection between mitigation actions like elevation or relocation. That's, that's not currently very clear at all. How can we make some of these changes? Well, states and locals could pay more of the disaster costs to begin with. Right now, who allows development? States and locals. It's not the federal government. It's not FEMA that's allowing. It's state and locals are allowing development in high-risk areas. Why? Because they know the taxpayer will bail them out if they have a flood, won't they? So, so that's not happening. <clears throat> that mitigation needs to be done in a way that would socially just and helps the disadvantaged. It needs to be done quickly. FEMA needs to use the Uniform Relocation Act to help people move to better areas. That sort of thing that can't happen right now because lower income people simply often can't afford the mitigation and it doesn't happen quickly enough. Future risk, the maps don't show future risk right now. FEMA claims it's gonna start doing that. They were told by Congress to do it 12 years ago, 10 years ago in 2012. Let's hope that starts to happen. Disclosure of risk before sale and the history of claims, that's very important. That needs to happen so that people know what they're buying. Uh, we need to decide how and where to build. There are communities, good communities that do that right now. Charlotte Mecklenburg's a case in point. They don't allow development in high risk areas. They map the future flood conditions and they keep people out of it. They ask their citizens or their city council, do you want us to map today's flood like FEMA does or map tomorrow's flood? And the flood levels would go up anywhere from two to nine feet. And they said, you'll map the future conditions because we don't want people to build and then get flooded. So there are communities that do that. And we need to help those communities do that sort of thing. Well, will things change? 
Can Congress make some major decisions? I don't know. Can Congress look at uh, what happens in the private sector? Congress, in theory, could say to the private sector, all homeowners insurance will cover all the major four hazards, fire, flood, wind, and earthquake. They were to do that, the private sector right now could do it. No question they could do it. There's plenty of maps out, as Paul says, they can figure out how to do it right now. Uh, but does that help us do a flood risk management program? So there's pros and cons to taking that approach. With that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you so much, Larry. And um, our final panelist is Anna Weber. So go ahead, Anna. All right, can you hear me okay? All right, thank you. Um, and thank you to all of our um, participants who are here in this session and for sticking with us, um, especially since the like cool flashy disaster books are right across the hall, so to speak. Um, so my name is Anna and I'm a policy analyst at the Natural Resources Defense Council, the NRC, NRDC, which is an environmental advocacy organization. And so um, our role, I suppose, is to sort of be a thorn in Paul's side, politely and in a friendly way, we like to think, um, to push FEMA and Congress as well to make the flood insurance program to be um, the most effective and equitable that it can be. And so I think it's, it's so interesting to have a book like this that helps us really zoom out on the underlying problems and challenges that, that we're facing with the program. I certainly never thought that I would be spending my time on flood insurance. I have a public health degree, <laughs> um, but it is such an interesting and critical way of looking at how we as people interact with and try to control our, our environment. Um, and to that uh, point, I um, so appreciate having this book as a, a way of helping us to think about flood insurance in a social science context. Um, I'm sure a lot of us here come from a physical science or a biological science background um, where, I mean, at least I was as a undergraduate science major sort of taught, oh, the social sciences, right? The, the hard, hard, so-called hard sciences are almost dismissive of the social and human lens um, on problems like these. And as I think we are all realizing and has come up several times in the sessions in this conference already today is that the social sciences and the social science perspective is absolutely critical to all of the problems that we're facing from climate change and beyond. Um, and so I think this book is so timely in that sense, really situating us in that context. Um, so in our work in working on the NFIP um, in, in my role, uh, we talk a lot about how the flood insurance program uh, could be a, a linchpin in the nation's climate adaptation policy um, because it has sort of under its jurisdiction all the things that we've been talking about with floodplain management and codes and standards and zoning and so, so on and so forth. But currently the way that it's operating uh, as we like to say, it could be a linchpin, but is currently a liability because of all of the challenges um, that the program is facing, especially in the context of climate change. Um, we talk a lot about how well in cheap insurance doesn't stop flooding <laughs> um, as, a, as an, oh, a sort of entrance to get people to think about all of the other components of the, of the flood insurance program, because the other components of the program, the mitigation parts and the floodplain management parts are in fact intended to stop flooding, or at least to stop the impacts of flooding on people and communities. And um, it, coming to the NFIP as I did as sort of an outsider to the program, I was never a flood insurance practitioner. It was just sort of became part of my advocacy portfolio when I started my job about four years ago. Um, it's so interesting to see this historical perspective of the NFIP as a work in progress and as a dynamic system. Um, instead of something that's sort of been fixed in place and, and unchanging. Um, I grew up in South Central Pennsylvania along the Susquehanna River. And so our big flood of record is hurricane or tropical storm Agnes, um, exactly 50 years ago, last month. Um, that's the one that people that where I grew up still talk about as like the big one. And so I've been thinking a lot about where have we gone in the last 50 years, which is also approximately the lifespan of the flood insurance program 
And there's, in some ways, so many things have changed over that time, as you document in your book, Rebecca. But on the other hand, so many things have not changed, or we are still trying to make them change, I guess. Um, and so I think I want to focus my comments on like, where are we now and sort of where we can go. Again, I, this is me, I would love to, as a you know, policy advocate, outsource some of our, our work here and ask you all, where should the National Flood Insurance Program be headed as we go into the next 50 years, right? Um, starting with this, uh, this sort of the tension that Larry was pointing to between um, FEMA as the agency running the program and Congress as the body directing um, uh, the, the, the policy sort of behind it. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, we've got, ooh, Larry, you can correct me if I'm wrong, 21 short-term reauthorizations of the flood insurance program now since 2017. The, um, the flood insurance program, as Rebecca talks about in her book, is supposed to be reauthorized every five years. And um, on the face of it, that looks like a great opportunity for change every five years. Um, but the last time that happened was in the bigger waters, essentially. And since then, after that five-year period expired in 2017, we've Congress has been sort of kicking the can down the road with a series of short-term reauthorizations. Um, and so maybe the next time will be the one that sticks, right? And we'll be able to have a real impact on not just the flood insurance program's next five years or 10 years, but 50 years. One of the things that we talk about a lot also in our work is the importance of transparency and disclosure uh, of flood risk. And Larry talked about this a little bit as well. Um, and it's not so much so that just people can make good decisions or communities making good decisions, but also governments sort of at all scales up and down from individual families and homeowners all the way up to federal governments. And so we talk a lot about climate smart decision making, which sort of rests on this idea that if everyone has the right information and there's a sort of linear pathway from good information to good decisions to good outcomes. And the book has such, I think, a good reminder that that, um, that linear pathway, first of all, doesn't exist. And of course, a good reminder that giving people, quote unquote, good objective information is probably the least effective way to, uh, to create a behavior change. That's just sort of not how human beings make decisions. And so um, I think that that is um, such an important reminder for those of us who are trying to change uh, the way that people sort of consider risk and make decisions, this concept of there being a true risk that we just have to uncover um, and then magically everyone will change how we make decisions about it again, all the way up and down the scales of people in communities is obviously not the case. And so how do we think about that in a more holistic way um, so that we're making decisions with good outcomes? Finally, um, uh, we've talked a little bit about risk rating 2.0 here and I hope we cover that in the discussions. That's something, as Larry was saying, is something that um, is taking up a lot of our time in sort of the flood insurance advocacy world right now. Um, FEMA, like sort of tagline for risk rating 2.0 is equity in action, right? Some of you may have heard that. Um, and it uh, refers to um, a sort of concept of fairness within the flood insurance program that wasn't there previously. Um, one of the big successes that FEMA is talking about in risk rating 2.0 is, is adjusting the way that higher valued properties were essentially being subsidized in their rates by lower valued properties. And so if your home, you know, the sort of typical stereotypical like big mansion on the beach or whatever was paying a relatively lower component of their share compared to someone who has a, a small older home, you know, in the back bay or near a river, for example. Um, but I think we need to move forward and, and go beyond that concept of fairness, um, which I think we're coming to understand is necessary, but not sufficient to have truly equitable outcomes. Um, and so one question that I'd love for us to think about and sort of grapple with is at its base, you know, what we're talking about here, flood insurance costs and payments. And insurance is sort of ultimately about reimbursement, right? It's about paying you back for something that you've lost. 
paying you back in dollars for something that you've lost that may or may not be easily measured in dollars. Um, that's something that I so appreciate you talking about in your book, Rebecca. Um, and so can something like an insurance program be truly equitable if it's based on paying you back for what society thinks is the value of what you've lost rather than say providing you for the resources that you need to have a certain outcome. Um, and I would love to hear what all of you have to say about that question um, and sort of how we can push the NFIP into being a real force for change because I, I think that it can be. Um, and we're not quite there yet, but we're, um, you know, we've, as we've seen in, in Rebecca's book, there is a, a really robust history to draw from as we move forward into that future. Thank you so much, Anna. And um, before we open up for questions, we're going to go ahead and give Rebecca about five minutes to respond. Um, thank you so much. There's so much here that is so interesting and provocative and I am going to have to be selective and it's killing me, but um, let me just start with say, saying something about risk rating 2.0. I mean, for me, Paul, I think what's more exciting about risk rating 2.0 than the kind of signaling to the policyholders at risk what the risk is in this granular way is that it might expand the number of people who understand that they face some amount of flood risk. Like it might actually deal with this problem that you have when you have a map that has zones and people are like, okay, I'm just on the outside of that zone. Doesn't mean that they have zero flood risk, right? It means that they don't have a high enough flood risk as determined by the map um, to require them to have a flood policy in place. And so, you know, I think this connects actually to Mayuki's point about health insurance, right? That if this is a way to get more people into the pool, into the risk pool, um, because more people now have some information about some quantity of risk that they face, um, then I think you might, you might have a kind of healthier program in certain ways. Um, that said, coming to kind of Larry's point about the debt of the program, I totally agree with you. And it's, I mean, it, the timing of this book was funny in that, you know, as I was writing it, $24 billion, $30 billion, these were held up as these like huge, unacceptable numbers. And then the pandemic hits and the kinds of spending we're talking about from the government, trillions of dollars, like 24 billion doesn't look like anything anymore. And this expectation that the NFIP ought to run like a business is, you know, it's a product of the Reagan years, you know, and, uh, you know, so, so, and I think this is why it's important to kind of take the longer view on the NFIP is to see that it's a program that's shaped by the kind of ideologies of the day. Um, it's a public program and it serves public aims. And, and I think the expectation that it should function like a private insurance company, which by the way, can drop you, uh, which the NFIP won't, uh, you know, I think is, is an unreasonable one. And I think it creates a lot of unproductive and distracting politics around the program. Um, uh, and then, you know, Anna, I think this point about disclosure and then what, I think is a really important one, you know, that, the, a lot of the talk right now is around risk disclosure and transparency. And it's like, but then there have to be options. There have to be tools that people can avail themselves of to, to make a different choice. Um, yeah, you know, coming back to, to my his initial uh, comments about choice. Um, and I think in some ways that, the, and you know, that the, the way that the NFIP gets kind of beat up on is a reflection of the fact that the demands on it are so high. Like we expect this program to be able to do so many things simultaneously that arguably seven different programs should be doing. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's and, and when recently, you know, when, when journalists get in touch, like they want a soundbite from me about, you know, how terrible the NFIP is and it's such a failure and everything. And it's like, you know, what I end up coming back to them with is, you know, we, we have to have a conversation about what it is that we want and the role that flood insurance is going to play in that. Like we can keep talking about maps, we can keep talking about prices, but what we have to reckon with is the fact that we have said that owning a home is the pathway to economic security in this country. And we're also in a world in which property values face serious threats all over the country, not just from floods, from wildfires, from storms, from other kinds of extreme weather. The stability of that model is in serious question right now. We can't expect the NFIP to solve that problem for us. We need to have a totally different set of conversations about what it means 
to be economically secure, what the kind of per the perks and also the burdens of private property look like, how we're going to house people in a way that is safe in a world that is becoming less safe. Um, and, 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 and how we're going to do all that in ways that don't reproduce the kinds of exclusions and marginalizations that have long characterized property ownership in the United States. Um, we know that the expansion of home ownership precisely at the historical moment when the NFIP was founded was a racially exclusionary project. Um, and when it became inclusionary it happened on predatory terms. And so, you know, we, there, all this to say that, you know, I think the NFIP is this kind of one piece of a, of a larger, much, much larger problem um, that we need a set of kind of democratic conversations to have about the world that we want and, and the role that insurance along with a lot of other different kinds of policy tools is going to play in it. Well, Rebecca, you just took my breath away with your comments as well. <laughs> so thank you. Um, you know, before I open it up for uh, questions, just I want everybody to feel very comfortable turning their cameras on. But if everyone would do me the favor, if you've read the book, would you give me a thumbs up, like one of the emojis or turn your video on? But let me see a thumbs up so we can kind of at least give our um, author a better idea and our panelists. So we have several. If you're not comfortable turning your camera on, just turn your thumbs up emoji on. That way I know you don't have your like hand raised. So if you have a thumbs up, I'm, I might call on you if we get to a point of questions. Um, but wow, wow, wow. And I am coming at you from the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma, who has learned so much from the sins of our past and uh, just all things flood related. And it's it's amazing having Larry and others on this call to hear this just history of where we've come from to get to where we are and the burden that's on all of our shoulders, the researchers, the practi practitioners, our federal government to figure this out. And so um, with that, I would really like to go ahead and um, open up the floor to the audience. And if you have a, a response, a comment, turn your camera on, get comfortable. Um, I am going to moderate this. So if I cut you off, I'm, I'm probably going to verbally cut you off this time so that we can give everybody an equal opportunity to uh, chat and ask their questions. Don't be shy, I know somebody has one. While I scroll up here and find the first one. All right, then I will go to uh, John Wiener. Are you on here still? On any comment on comparison of insurance costs to public versus costs to the public of devastated families and communities was the question from John. Um, yeah, I think this uh, this was actually addressed in some of the um, the comments from the panelists about you know the the comparison of NFIP claims to disaster relief, um, which is this kind of sneaky you know non accounting form of accounting where it's it's not budgeted for um, uh, in the way that other things are budgeted for, and so it ends up just kind of getting written off, but that the you know the costs are huge um, uh, relative to what, you know, insurance claims look like. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I think I lost the audio there as you're reading that question, Annie, but if it is that chat question, um, think about the customer experience. So if you don't have flood insurance and you're flooded or a different natural disaster, like a wildfire or something, what is available to you if you don't have insurance? And in the FEMA world, it's individual assistance. Individual assistance is set up so that we're providing temporary assistance. So no permanent repairs. It might be a generator to get a fan going in your home to dry it out. It might be accessibility because trees fell down to your road, I mean, to your house. And accessibility means they're just cutting down the trees and, not, and dragging them off or dumping gravel, not fixing anything, right? So that individual assistance averages in a, in a normal disaster, four to $5,000. 
and a lot of that assistance is temporary living. So um, allowing you to take some money to live in a hotel for a period of time, things like that. So if, if you don't have insurance and you're only getting about five to $6,000 from FEMA, then you're going to the, to the nonprofits, Red Cross, other not charitable foundations like Catholic Charities. And you're already going through on the social aspect, like the worst experience of your life, right? So now you're going to nonprofits to find aid. And if you can't find enough aid, then we actually seen people go, go fund me, which is not uncommon now, and, and asking for charity from neighbors. And then the last thing is they go to SBA, the Small Business Administration, where it is a loan. So we, we, if you qualify, and that's, a, that's an equity issue in itself, if you qualify, the government will give you a low interest loan, try to normalize your, your mortgage payment, in a, wrap it in and, more, and normalize your mortgage payment. But you might've been on a 30 year loan, they might expand it to a 45 year loan. They might discount the inter interest rate, but you're still paying more in principle than I mean, interest than you are in principle. So insurance is a good way to recover. And, and the federal assistance is, is often lacking. And to Rebecca's book, it's politically driven. Not all areas are actually declared. So if your hometown um, is just experience a small disaster, it might not be declared, which means no individual assistance SBA is granted. And I think maybe that's a good segue into the next question that we had was about eligibility for flood insurance outside the 100 year flood plan. But I, I might add on to this question and, and send it over to Anna. Um, because I think it's important in this conversation too, in terms of disasters, is, is the, the public have so many expectations of what FEMA is or is not going to bring to bear when they're impacted. And so uh, for those that don't have flood insurance because of these misconceptions that they can't access that flood insurance, what resources are actually available to them? And um, is there really ever a mechanism to make somebody truly whole after an event? Um. Yeah, that's that's such a good question. Um, and the, and the, the questions that we have in the chat are exactly the same questions that get asked over and over again about the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, and Rebecca, you pointed this in your book because there's um, the flood insurance program is largely, um, the way that people, homeowners, policyholders experience it is through what we, they call a write your own program. It's not like you call up FEMA and buy a flood insurance program from Paul you call up your state farm agent or whoever is selling you insurance on the other things that you're insuring in your life. And they add a flood insurance policy into that. And it is part of the NFIP, but the way that it's actually sort of administered from the customer perspective is from uh, a private insurance company. And so um, that's probably why a lot of folks don't even know if they have flood insurance. Um, we hear over and over again after a flood, people saying, oh, I, I thought I had flood insurance. I thought it was part of my homeowner's insurance, which it isn't. Um, or I didn't think I could get flood insurance because I'm either in or out of a flood zone. Um, I, I've mentioned this in the chat. We had a big flood in my hometown a few years ago. And so I was hearing from like my parents, neighbors and you know my high school friends and, and, and so on saying, oh, but I, I don't have flood insurance because I couldn't get it because I wasn't in the flood zone. Or alternately, I didn't have flood insurance because I couldn't get it because I was in the flood zone. Um, these are folks in the same neighborhood telling me the exact opposite thing. As, um, and so we can really see a big knowledge gap in terms of um, how the public is just super confused about flood insurance and that can't be helping. <laughs> um, but in, in terms of... Um, you know, insurance's role in other types of, of aid. Um, I, I was in a talk once and um, there was a, a local emergency manager describing how uh, members of her community think what will happen after a disaster. And she says, they imagine giant jet planes flying overhead and it says FEMA on the side and big bags of money come falling out. And that's what happens after a disaster, right? Like, uh, not literally, at least, but figuratively speaking, FEMA comes in and just pours money and it comes out of the sky. And all you have to do is stand outside with a bucket, right? Um, and that couldn't be further from the truth because 
the cases that Paul is talking about where folks are getting a few thousand dollars in individual assistance after disaster, it's the best case scenario. Those are the folks who know that that kind of assistance is out there, who can navigate the process to get it, who have all of the documentation that they need in order to show that they quote unquote deserve this assistance. Um, they know how to, um, you know, get in touch with the resources that they need in order to apply for things. They um, have connections in the community to, to make that happen. And so many people just don't even have that level of access to a system that is supposed to be, you know, something that helps the most vulnerable after a disaster. And that's part of the reason why we so, so see so many inequitable outcomes after disaster comes through. Um, and and this question of making people whole, I think is something that I would probably punt back to Rebecca. Like we need like a sociologist to talk about like, what does that even mean, right? Um, it's one thing to say, oh, you lost your, I don't know, living room furniture and it costs X number of dollars and we're gonna pay you X number of dollars to buy new living room furniture. Um, but even in that fairly straightforward case, like does that make you whole? You know, what about the memories that you made while you were sitting on that living room furniture? Um, and like, can, can there be a way of, of addressing disaster loss where we actually do make people whole? I don't know. Um, but I think that's one of the really critical questions that the, this program and, and the, the whole way that we deal with disasters um, as a society is really grappling with. Thank you. Um, I'm going to actually toss it over to Miyuki to address the comments about maybe how this can, the comparison between the flood risk and wildfire risk that is the conversation happening in the chat. Sure. Um, sure. So I, I have been following the, the California wildfire insurance situation to some extent, but not super in depth. So I'm sure there's someone, uh, someone in the, in the zoom room who knows this in more detail than I do. Um, but, but my impression is that for the large, for in most contexts, there's a, a backstop government run insurance program for homeowners that can't insure, uh, can show that they can't, they can't find insurance on the private market. So in California, that's called the fair plan. And the state essentially provides a, it's, it's not a terribly good insurance policy. It's fairly expensive for the coverage that you get, but it does allow you to insure your home. And so you can get a mortgage and continue to, to be in compliance in that sense. And so a lot of the wildfire related drops in coverage, those people end up in this government run plan. And I think, um, so on the surface, you still end up with the government bearing a lot of risk. With the NFIP, you at least have these other mechanisms for incentivizing flood risk management, floodplain management, you have some control over kind of price signals about risk um, and, uh, and you can enforce building codes and so forth. Um, you can't do that with, with wildfire since it's not explicitly a wildfire insurance program, but you still end up with kind of the riskiest homes uh, being backed, the property, like the property value of the most, the riskiest homes being backed by the government. Um, I think I'm sure there must be other models uh, uh, in other countries, for instance, that like um, are a little bit more sweeping. Like I, I know in some places they have a single like every single homeowner pays a certain amount into an all perils solidarity fund. Right. And that's sort of like the kind of if you took the flood insurance program and blew it up to cover everything and required everyone to pay some into it. Um, would be one approach to dealing with it. But I think what we're seeing so, so far in other hazards is this like kind of slow and steady trend toward some government holding the, the risk in the end, just in different forms than what we have in the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, yeah, I just to add to that, this is actually a point that Anna made in a, um, a talk she gave at I think University of Southampton in England. Um, but she pointed out that what's going on in California with wildfire, the conditions are not dissimilar to the conditions that led to the creation of the National Flood Insurance Program, where you have um, private companies who have decided that it is no longer appealing to do that business and are pulling up stakes, are not renewing policies, are raising rates to prohibitive levels. 
Um, you know, and so, so the creation of kind of public backstops like the fair plan, I think that's something to watch. I think that's, that's going to become more and more important. Um, the other thing about wildfire, and this was, there's a chapter of Mackenzie Funk's book, Windfall, about this, is that, you know, Malibu burns every year. Um, but the rich and famous are always going to live in Malibu. And they're always going to be able to find insurance for their homes. And it's sold by AIG and, and companies that will craft a premium, well, a, a high-end insurance product that comes with things like a private team of firefighters who will drive to your house in Malibu and spray it with flame retardant foam, um, you know, and, and pass the public fire trucks on the way. Um, so, you know, I think in, in wildfire as in flood insurance, especially as kind of private insurers try to bite off more of that business, I think one of the things we also need to be thinking about are these protection gaps um, between the quality of coverage that different people can buy into. Um, and, you know, Mayuki's point about the kind of limitations of the fair plan, I think is, is also relevant in that respect. Um, I want to hold on the conversation really fast about Canada and jump to make sure we have enough time for this one, because I think it's so important. Um, Aaron had asked, what about renters and um, immigrants? What are they supposed to do? The rental conversation comes up time and time again in disaster and certainly with flood insurance. So if anyone wants to start on that question. I'm happy to jump in. I mean, uh, when we think about insurance, renters uh, need it just as much as a homeowner, but we don't sell it to them as often and we don't target that audience. So what we learned after Hurricane Maria was we thought we saw how much uh, the lack of insurance hurt the community in Puerto Rico. And then we started putting out flood insurance advertisements only to realize that many in Puerto Rico uh, that we were targeting in the dense cities were renters. So if you start thinking about that along with affordability, we, we tried a new campaign that essentially said, for as low as $99 a, a year, I think you got something like 20 some thousand dollars worth of renters coverage. And it was exceedingly successful. Like, and it was as simple as we weren't putting our customer hat on. We weren't saying who is the audience that needs this most? What is the, the avenue to best reach them? And what is the product that they want, right? And, and can afford. And we're, gonna, we're learning from that social sciences, behavioral sciences methods on how to market and outreach the product. And we're finding that is much more successful than simply saying, hey, where it rains, it can flood and you should buy flood insurance, right? So um, the renters market, uh, unfortunately, is still kind of in terms of our 5 million policyholders, a small, small, small for, uh, fraction, but it's something that we're starting to learn more about and trying to address more. But it is available. Contents only insurance is available through the National Flood Insurance Program. It's something we highly recommend. And, and generally, from an affordability perspective, is more affordable. Great. And I want to acknowledge that Aaron participated in one of our book clubs, Aaron Flores. Do you have any questions you want to specifically ask them beyond that, Aaron, or any comments? Um, sure. So I think I forget exactly which part of the book um, it was in, but I was really interested in like the land surveyors or and um, engineers like coming into communities and providing like elevation certificates, um, but how costly that can be. And so I was wondering like what would be a mechanism for a financially strapped community that doesn't know their flood risk to, 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 to do that, to perform one of those studies or something. Um, yeah, this is a huge problem um, because, you know, I think we often think about equity, uh, you know, as kind of within a community that there are kind of richer and poorer people who live in different relationship to property and different relationships to water. But I think there's also an equity story between different kinds of communities. And, and there's a question that's just coming through the chat uh, um, related to this as well. Um, you know, the fact that the story kind of exploded in New York City is interesting, but it's it's idiosyncratic in, in the respect that New York City is an incredibly affluent city in terms of the amounts of revenue that it can generate to deal with some of these issues and to fund their own research and 
you know, advocate on their own behalf, right? There, the, the U.S. is not made up of a bunch of New York cities, right? But New York City is pretty exceptional in that, in that respect. I think much more commonly you have communities where the, the resources to kind of engage in that are much more limited. And so there I think you will see the fates of entire places can start to diverge unless we're paying attention to that, unless we're saying, you know, there has to be a plan for making sure that, that whatever, whatever kind of policy options are on the table that, the, the, you know, as Anna put it, that like need is driving those determinations um, rather than just kind of the, the raw ability to hire the right number of consultants or, or you know, get the, the right team of lawyers to, to fight it out for you. I think that's a good connection to uh, Sarah's question. And this is targeted right at Anna. Um, Anna, do you see that question in the chat? It's related to the requirements to buy flood insurance. Um, one of the common issues, and this is very common, is uh, residents expect a good local government to make changes in their drainage, different development tools, et cetera, to help get their neighbor neighborhood out of the flood zone so they won't need to buy flood insurance. But sometimes these changes do little to uh, really change much of that risk that exists, but just enough to remove the insurance requirement. Any thoughts on doing that? Yeah, that's such an, an interesting question, and it, it certainly is something that happens. Um, I think what Sarah is talking about in terms of the um, insurance requirement, in case those, in case anyone here doesn't know what that refers to is that if you are within um, the mapped 100 year floodplain um, in a community that participates in the National Flood Insurance Program. So that's a place where uh, there's a 1% chance of a flood in a given year. Um, not that it will happen once every 100 years, but in every year there's a one in 100 chance. Um, if you have a federally backed mortgage, which is most people who have a mortgage, um, you are required to have flood insurance basically as a condition of your mortgage. Um, and that's, that's the requirement on paper. Um, in reality, it's not enforced terribly well. The mortgage lenders are supposed to be the ones who are making sure that this is, stays on the books. Um, and every once in a while, you'll, you know, see a little blurb, or at least I will, because I look for them in the news, um, like in the business news where it's, oh, so-and-so bank has to pay so-and-so many thousand dollars because they failed to require their policyholders to have you know, mortgage holders to have um, flood insurance. Um, so it, it, in reality, it's it's um, less of a firm requirement than it may seem on paper. Um, a lot of the time what happens is folks will get a flood insurance policy when they take out a mortgage. Um, but since there isn't necessarily a lot of follow-up and mortgages get bought and sold, um, the policy will often lapse. And FIP policies are almost always for one year and so um, sort of tails off. Anyway, so this, uh, what Sarah is talking about is I think something that comes up a lot, which seems to be almost like a tension between community action and individual action when it comes to flood risk, um, where, well, if it, and sort of almost mm, perverse uh, incentives, you might say, and, and uh, this idea, which is only human, where if, oh, something is put in place to protect me, then I'm safe and I can maybe take more risks than I would before. If I'm living behind a levee, that's great, I'm protected. I can build more houses there because we're protected. And you end up actually being in a riskier uh, situation than you were even before maybe. Um, and this is something where I think that, um, again, going back to risk rating 2.0, we might be on a pathway to help address because previously under the NFIP, before risk rating 2.0, there was a very sort of black and white distinction of whether or not you were quote unquote in a flood zone. I keep using scare quotes on that because everyone lives in a flood zone. It's just like, what's your level of risk, right? We're usually talking about the hundred year floodplain when we talk about a flood zone. And then basically if you were next to the river in a hundred year flood zone, or you were like three blocks away in the hundred year flood zone, you would still be categorized in the same way. And Rebecca in your book, this part blew my mind, talks about creating like social connection between those homeowners, which is something I never thought about before. But anyway, under risk rating 2.0, um, the, the idea is to sort of graduate the way that insurance is priced and sold so that um, there's a spectrum of risk that's communicated in those zones instead of just whether you're in or out. And I think that might be um, 
uh, a way to sort of start at getting at those issues. Thanks, Anna. And we have about three more minutes left for questions. And so I want to kind of close it with this one with each of the panelists, starting with Larry and maybe ending with Paul is what would you tell Canada? Or basically, if we could start over again, what would we do different? And how does that lean us forward into where we're going? I don't think the basic concept of the NFI plea is wrong. First thing I would say is do it better. Uh, make Don't use a hundred year flood. That's a standard that's never was good. We almost got stuck with a 50 year flood. Uh, Denmark uses a 10,000 year, you know, so we, we, uh, we need to have stronger standards and you need to do better mapping. Make sure you, even if you have insurance like we do, yes, you can only charge insurance based on today's risk, but you can have layers because all maps now have layers and they're all digital. You can have layers that show here's where the water is going to be in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years. So you can do better mapping. You can do better uh, ways of providing the risk. Uh, you can do a lot of things better than we've done it. So do it, but do it very carefully because there's a lot of elements. As, as Rebecca pointed out, this program has lots of balls in the air and it's tough to do. Ask Paul, he'll tell you. <laughs> Go ahead. Somebody else can, jump in. Me, yeah, I, I can jump in with a couple of thoughts. I think... Um, I think I read it in this book, or it might have been somewhere else, that um, when, at the beginning of the NFIP, when there were subsidized rates put in place for these houses that already existed, the creators sort of thought that the, that eventually they would disappear, right? Because people would move away, and so the, the burden of subsidized rates would go down over time, naturally. And of course, that didn't happen at all. Um, and... And instead, we've been putting more and more into flood zones because right, getting the, the price signals versus the political benefits and so forth are, are tough to, to design, really. Um, so if, if I were, I think, starting from scratch, there's a couple of things, right? One would be in the highest risk area, however you want to designate it, no new construction. Or no new construction, that would be federally insured. Um, I think the second would be investing a lot in creating choices for people who are in those very flood prone places already, right? And then I think there has to be, I guess, to me, like the affordability and availability dual objective, <laughs> those just seem to be fundamentally at odds with one another. Um, and I, I guess some, you know, clarity in the founding, the founding documents of this program should clarify really what the goals are and is this intended to be a social safety net um, or not? And I think paired with this, like you paired with a, a really much stricter um, constraint on the potential increase in exposure and burden in the highest risk places and an active effort to get to reduce that the the population in the most well formed places I think would actually you know set it on a on a path that is a little bit more stable and perhaps clearer than the one that NFIP has gone down over the past 50 years. Thank you Miyuki. We have approximately ending on promptly on time like a minute and a half left so I'm gonna let um Rebecca, maybe a few final comments to bring it on home with that one. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a lot to add um, beyond what, what Larry and Mewhi have said. I, you know, I will say, I guess I've just come through my research and you know, perhaps through just being a sociologist, come to be very skeptical of economists' claims about the incentive effects of pricing. And I think uh, if you're gonna create a program from scratch, creating one that doesn't fetishize that as this nudge that's going to deliver us into salvation, um, I think is, is, would be an important thing to keep in mind. I think thinking about, you know, making sure people have coverage, making that sure that people have financial protection of a kind, then also thinking about hazard mitigation, you know, and relating these 
but also thinking of them as kind of distinct issues, uh, you know, distinct problems that need different tools to, to be solved, I think is an important part of it. All 20 seconds. I don't know if they're going to cut us I, off or not. <laughs> I just told the Canadians, know what you want to get out of this. Start with the end in mind. Because if you start designing without that in mind, then I think the design is going to lead to a different answer. And uh, I, all the comments were fantastic. And I think part of that is we got to build the future risks, right? Um, you can't build it today. I mean, the average life span of a home is 20 to 40 years. So you're not building to today's risks, right? Um, we have to figure out what the future holds and build to that. Very good. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. We are on the nose. This has been an awesome, awesome book, awesome session. I hope you guys do this every single year, Jennifer, since you're still on here. And um, thank you to everyone for listening and tuning in. Thank, thank you, you so much, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye.